Oh, that's the part where we have to start watching what we say, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. You should know by now we don't censor ourselves. All right. Now, we would ask everybody to stay muted here just because the audio gets to be a little clippy and a little nasty. But we do love seeing your faces, so by all means, turn the cameras on if you're not too shy. Um, chat will be open all night, too. So uh, I, um, looks like Evan is with us, despite hiding away. Um, his backdrop's not too pretty when we do these tastings from the shop, I can, I can promise you. Um, so we'll have Evan probably for a bit of it at least, myself and Harmony watching the chat as well. So feel free to drop some comments in. Um, tasting notes and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, upcoming events, Harmony, what do we have coming up really in the next little bit, aside from, you know, Thursday? It's a little bit of a big one for us. Uh, yeah, this. Thursday we have the festival, which is always a good time. Uh, today was tough. I mean, we have a very cool port tasting happening in store and uh, Matt, I wish we could do two events in one night, like staggered in time, but you had to choose. Not give them more ideas, Harmony. Port and, and bourbon and, and rye, and we obviously chose the better of the two events, so we're here. Um, we have, yeah, the Whiskey Festival, that's, you know, unfortunately always sold out, but we also have the MS Festival uh, coming up in uh, January. All proceeds go to the MS Society, so we're excited to do that again. That's actually one of the first... Uh, times I actually got to work with Kensington Wine Market was when I was uh, sneaking away, volunteering my time and uh, working MS and Andrew walked up to me, what, what the heck are you doing here? And I was like, hey man, it's whiskey and it's charity, of course I'm here. Um, it was my first experience with Kensington, which is fun. We have a uh, very exciting, kind of rare and old whiskeys, 20 is the new 30 tasting coming up November 23rd. Um, so if you don't have a kit, there's still kits. You can come swing by tomorrow and pick it up. Uh, it's going to be a really cool lineup. Lots kind of old school meets new school and Andrew's running that one. So yeah, full of deep knowledge and passion there. Um, and then we there's have the big boy. The what? The, there's the big boy tasting. The big boy yeah. tasting. Oh, the kinship tasting. Yeah, I mean, big boys in terms of whiskey, not big boys in terms of who should attend. This is a absolutely stellar lineup, and I'm so excited for this tasting. Yeah. Um, do you remember the prices on that one, Harmony? The price on the kinship? two twenty five. dollars Yeah, it's an expensive one, but the amount of years you're drinking of absolutely incredible Isla whiskeys is mind-blowing. Um, I think there was a handful of spots left when last we talked, 14 spots left. Um, this is absolutely worth spending the money on. Uh, you're going to have memories from this as opposed to that 225 bucks you spent on a bottle you forget about. You just tasting, way cool tasting. Yeah. No, it's going to be awesome. <clears throat> but, just, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm saying I'm just putting the order in the chat for people who are asking. Thank you. Um, I was just going to say we're at that point where um, we should shut up and we have some way cool people here to do something fun with us tonight. Um, a while ago, Harmony and I sat down with Jason and Robert and we had an afternoon of sipping and chatting and kind of shooting the shit for a while. And it was a rad little session. And then not only did we walk away going, yeah, these guys are fun. I want to do something cool with them. Um, we went yeah, let's bring in pretty much anything they release because everything they got is really cool and we're not on it. Um, so we're happy to have this stuff on the shelves and we're super happy that we could get a couple of special ones here, sneak peeks here for you tonight. Um, we can chat about and we're you know greedily holding our hands out for these to arrive and be able to pass them on to you guys. Um, so we'll just ask uh, Robert, looks like he's a little bit, you know, fighting uh, being under the weather here. So. We'll let him unmute or mute as he sees fit, but uh, we'd love to have your voice involved here too. Um, but uh, without any kind of further ado, uh, unless Harmony has anything to add there, I'm going to turn it over to Jason and uh, let him tell us a little bit of a story and feel free, as you guys know, grill away, throw those questions in the chat and we'll interrupt them time and time again to uh, see if you can tell you everything you want to know. Jason, good to see you, man. Yeah, hey, thanks for uh, thanks for having me and 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 carrying our product and uh 
Robert, you guys are such great hosts when I was up there. First time I'd been across that border. Um, what a great time I had. We, we, we had a whirlwind of a week up there, but uh, you all definitely stood out. We had a great time tasting up there. And, and like I said, I really appreciate you carrying our product. Uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask or stop me, but um, I can give a little bit of a uh, history of the company and what we do, and then we can start tasting. So I can talk till the cows come home, so you may have to interrupt me. <laughs> well, let's start with a little history about yourself, Jason. What's your background, and how did you become a, a whiskey blender? That's a great question. Um, I actually have been in the restaurant business uh, for a good part of my life. I, I started my first restaurant when I was 21. But I think the crucial point came uh, in 2005, I decided to open up a place called Bourbon's Bistro here in, in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, did some research about bourbon. I was always a big fan of bourbon and um, wanted, to, wanted to, you know, after I got to doing the research and uh, just, I wanted to educate the world about bourbon. And if you think about where you were on your bourbon journey, if you were, uh, in 2005, I was opening up uh, a restaurant called Bourbons. And uh, I wanted a great, great uh, restaurant plus a great bourbon bar. We took a bunch of, um, you know, we took some cues from Napa wine country with, we started doing bourbon flights because we wanted to educate people about bourbon. We started uh, a lot of first barrels from a lot of the distilleries down here for single barrel programs. I think I was the first uh, restaurant bar to ever do a, a barrel of Four Roses. So it was kind of early on in, in the whole bourbon game now, if you, if you look back on it. And uh, this year we just got uh, Whiskey Bar of the Year by Whiskey Magazine uh, for North America. So wow. it took me 17 years to be an overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, awesome. Yeah, I've been uh, so, like I said, tasted bourbon and over the years did a lot of single barrel programs, uh, met all the master distillers. You know, I, I think at some point it, it seems like I felt like I've tasted the best of the best uh, that these distilleries had to offer. And, and I just kind of wanted to throw my hat in the ring and start my own bourbon company. Um, at first we tried to get a distillery funded because I'm pretty strict on how I like my whiskey and, uh, fell a little bit short of raising $30 million for the distillery. I don't know why you wouldn't give me 30 million bucks, but they just didn't. And, uh, decided to start our own brand and, uh, like a bunch of other companies that are new to the market, we we're sourcing whiskey. Uh, but maybe unlike other companies, we're very transparent about what we do. We source whiskey from MGP in Indiana. We tell everybody that. Uh, but what makes us different is I've been working with Independent Stave Company. They're the biggest barrel maker in the world. And uh, I've developed some proprietary finishing barrels. These aren't small barrels. They're 53 gallon barrels. What we do uh, is we use kind of an alchemy. We we heavily toast these barrels and we use a number one char. And if you're familiar with uh, the char levels, it's just one, two, three, and four. The industry basically uses three and four char. Through our studies and through uh, uh, independent stave company has a, has a wood research department that I use all the time. And uh, a fellow that works there is a good friend of mine uh, is, is making some really some, a big headway in the whiskey business, uh, showing how much char one is better than char four as far as uh, extractives and uh, takes it to the chemical level of doing chemical extraction of what, what uh, wood sugars we're bringing out and what, what uh, bad things we're leaving behind, acids and tannins and things. Um, so it's kind of a, it, it's, it's really, I like the art of it and I like the old school uh, tradition of it, 
but him bringing technology to it is is really fascinating. So I've so learned more, learned more about wood over the past few okay. years. When you talk about your proprietary barrel, are you doing some experimentation still? Do you have some other projects oh, yeah. in the works doing some funky stuff with barrels? Yeah, for sure, for sure. So it's an ongoing thing. Um, oh. one, one easy way to look at this is there's a lot of lignin in oak. Uh, at certain temperatures, lignin breaks into vanillin and vanillin is a big component in vanilla. So that's just the basic component. So through chemical analysis, we look at all these spider graphs and bar, bar graphs and all that. Uh, through chemical extraction, we can tell what time and temperature the lignin starts to break down and it breaks into vanillin. So then vanillin shoots through the roof and then it's a huge, huge um, onslaught of vanillin. So we know right there, we stop the process that that's a vanilla barrel. And it goes through, there's several different um, uh, there's several different components that come out of the wood. There's um, glycol, eugenol, furfural, uh, a lot of, it's a breakdown of hemicellulose. It's like I said, I've learned more about wood over the past three years and, it, and I don't know anything about it. You know, just kind of scratching the surface, but we know that it does impart good flavors on the whiskey. If you guys have ever tasted um, or, or seen Maker's 46 program, they, right. use, they use these staves to uh, enhance the flavor. Well, he developed that program for Maker's Mark, and they use staves, and we use whole barrels. So I have a library. I have 15 barrels that I can use almost like a spice rack. And I buy MGP juice, and I say it needs to go in these barrels, and then we blend it from there. Um, so in the nutshell, that's kind of what we do right now. Uh, we will be buying and having our own we're contract work through BBC, which is Bardstown Bourbon Company. We will be having our own new make made this year. Uh, oh. So we'll have, we'll have a say in every bit of it, and then it'll hit a number one char barrel from the get-go. So if you talk to any master distiller, 70% of the flavor comes from the wood. doesn't matter. 70% of the flavor comes from the wood. Uh, so what, you know, if everybody's out there blending these uh, sourced products, what makes us different is we work with the wood and we're kind of reverse engineering. We're almost working backwards. Uh, we're, we're going where the flavor is. And, and it's, uh, to me, I think it's, it's somewhat groundbreaking for the industry. We don't use rum barrels. We don't use any used barrels. We use all brand new barrels. Uh, we use it one time and then we send it away. Um, we also, we, we buy aged whiskey, which has been in a three and four char, uh, but then it goes into our barrels. It only sits in our barrels for maybe anywhere from two to six months. So it's a pretty neat operation and it makes a huge difference uh, that, that we, we feel it does. You're very much doing what um, Gordon McPhail do in the Scotch world, which is brilliant because they're heralded as the greatest at what they do by controlling their whole wood policy from start to finish and everything. It's pretty cool that you guys have taken a, a, a similar approach. Is it, uh, you know, for the longevity of your whiskeys, for being able to watch them from start to finish, it's, there's no better way to do it, I think, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, we also, I mean, we dry age our uh, our staves in the yard. So our, our mm -hmm. uh, our staves are dry, dry aged for 18 months. Uh, the closest one to that is Maker's Mark and they do nine months. So we do double that. And, and if anybody's in the restaurant business or knows a good steak, uh, it's almost like a dry aged steak. What that does, it breaks all the tannins down while it sits out there. And it, 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 just, it, it just breaks the structure down of the wood and it makes much for a much better, um, for a better stave for our barrels. Very cool. Well, let's start and explore this char one bourbon uh, and see how those staves are interacting with the spirit. Um, and while we're nosing it, uh, Jason in the chat, Evan asked, what uh, mash bill for BBC, question uh, mark. So I think he's meaning, what, what is your mash bill that you're thinking of using? Well, you know, we haven't gotten that far yet. Um, sure. BBC has a ton of mash bills. I'm, I'm, Personal friends with uh, Steve Steve Nally down there, 
and they do have a ton of mash bills. I don't know if we're going to be, be able to bring in our own or that we can use one that they have because once they do a run, they'll do a run just for us. So I think the bigger thing to look at with that is a yeast strain. And I'm okay. trying to look at a, 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 a vintage re yeast strain. Uh, I don't know if you guys, you guys have Wilderness Trail up there. I'm pretty sure. And I don't, uh, I don't know. No? I don't think so. I'm going to look it up. Well, they just sold the. Uh, yeah, we don't we don't have wilderness trail up here yet. Right. Okay. As well, far they as just, I know, they're about a ten year old distillery. Uh, they started out two uh, two buddies that they're doctors of microbiology, and they started out. Uh, I think their their first business was called Firm Solutions, and they made and replicated um, yeast for all these distilleries, and then they decided to open up their own distillery. Uh, about 10 years ago, um, and they just sold for 100 or 600 million. Whoa. Yeah. Maybe uh, they can invest in your distillery for you. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> one of the guy, one of the partners there, Dr. Pat Heist, he's a, a little bit shorter than I am, a little bit younger than I am, and, and got this fire red beard and hair and he's way more country than I am. And he's a, he's a doctor of microbiology. It's, it's, it just, it's funny to even see him talk. I mean, it's unbelievable. But uh, I guess he's I guess he's a lot richer today. <laughs> no doubt. So what's the mash bill on this first bourbon here? So we do use two different mash bills on our bourbon from MGP. We use um, a 36% rye and a 21% rye. We blend that. And it's also a four to six year blend. So what we're doing is we're starting with this big wide cone at the top. And then kind of narrowing it down. Basically, MGP is the top level. Uh, we kind of blend some of their stuff and then we put it into our barrels. And then we have a recipe that we're working on uh, with the blend of our barrels to try to come up with a very consistent product at the end of the day. And on uh, just moving it around in the glass, you can see how like heavy and, and viscous the spirit looks. And it's got these long, thick legs to it, like so pretty. And then on the palate, it's like so spicy and finishes so sweet for me. And it's just really enjoyable, but and, and not like uh, it's like sweet in a nice way where some bourbons like all sweet corn and I, it's not my favorite. Right. This is uh, got a nice kind of toasty vanilla to it that's we, i really we, enjoy we like those uh we like those spicier um we kind of love those spicier uh bourbons the higher rise because we we can't add a lot of sweetness to it even though in the barrels we can't add smoke and spice how we how we uh you know treat the barrels but it's easy to get that sweetness out of it for sure mm -hmm. That's a crazy cool nose. The fruit tones are just over the top for this. Um, yeah. Normally I would expect like way more spice, way less fruit and the fruit to be a little more one dimensional, if I'm being honest. Like a lot of times you look for like those big cherry notes and stuff like that. This is really jammy. It's got like a lot of cool, like dark fruit notes. I love that. I kind of, uh, you know, I call it the whole dog and pony show where I, we try to get the front, middle and back and then a little bit of a finish down here, the Kentucky hug. You know, I'm looking for that whole dog and pony show, you know. Um, you'll get some that'll finish on the front or in the middle or in the back. I, I, I want that whole thing. I want that whole experience. I want a viscous mouthfeel. And we, we can add things that's cool, you know. We add different barrels or different. It, it's wild when we're working in the lab. It, it, it's pretty, pretty cool. Dictionary definition of the Kentucky hug? Yeah, all the dictionary definition, I would say uh, it's just when it, you know, that, that whiskey finishes in your chest and it grabs your heart and, you know, you've got a taste of Kentucky right there, baby. I love it. <laughs> That's just very nice. The same yeast every time. Like it's so got that what's the significance here on the 52.5%? I noticed that uh, all of the whiskeys are 52.5, except your barrel strengths a little bit higher. Uh, obviously, they're not barrel strength because they're exactly the same. So why that number specifically? 
Well, we figured that um, uh, to me, we wanted to put, we put sipping whiskeys in the name because I love sitting around sipping whiskeys. And, mm-hmm. you know, I don't usually do anything under a hundred proof. And that's not because, you know, I want to get hammered or anything. That's because, you know, these days, as opposed to say back in the forties or prohibition days, you have to, you have to have a little bit of proof in there to have some flavor because I mean, you can't add anything to rye or bourbon, but water, you know, and all you're doing is watering it down. So uh, to me, there's more flavor in a 105 than say a hundred or even a 90 proof. And that's kind of my wheelhouse. I love, I love to get that flavor. I love them to be, you know, I don't want them to taste like 105, so we work on the, on that. But you can add a drop of water, you can add uh, ice cube, and still you're gonna that flavor is gonna stand up. And yeah. also, and I and I feel that you can make a cocktail out of these. I'm not a cocktail person for the most part, but you can add whatever you add on top of this. It's gonna stand up to that. And you're gonna know when you're sipping it neat. You're gonna know that it's there and that that it's a good. To me, it, it, it just stands up. It's a good sipping whiskey. You know, Absolutely. so 105 is our minimum. I That's think, great. Yeah, I don't think we'll do anything under 105. It's a comfortable strength. I find, you know, and when, when we all get into this, we find that, holy crap, it goes to like 60% in a higher moment. I remember those like shockingly high alcohols in the beginning. We think it's just a, you know, 40% or type thing. Um, the older I get, the more I'm like, nah, we can dial back from there a little bit. I'm kind of at a 48 to 52, 53 kind of is my preferred delivery. And you guys are right in my wheelhouse for where you've got it all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and yet I like that it's a higher proof because you, like you said, you still have that mouth feel that gets lost with dilution. And, and for a lot of us who've been in the, in the drinking game for a lot, a while, it's, it's it's about all the levels uh, that a whiskey can can give you. It's not just flavor. It's it's tone and texture and that Kentucky hug, and you'll lose that if you water it down too much. Sure. And not that you know, not that we don't try to make it for uh, people coming onto the market or coming into the category. It's just uh, you know, I think we all graduate to a certain point of of what you want to drink. And, you know, whether you're at this level or not, uh, like I said, I think it, 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 it's also good in a cocktail or you can you can put it on ice and and, and still be across the board. It's going to be a good flavorful whiskey. Yeah. Um, there was a question in the chat just a moment ago about uh, the yeast. Uh, Benny had a question about the yeast MGP uses for their whiskey. Uh, you buy from MGP, are all their yeasts the same? Um, I think you partially answered that. No, not all the yeasts are the same, but do they like, um, do they have a category or like catalog of yeast that you can select from? Or are you able to bring in your own strain of someone else cultivated? How does that work for you? You know, I'm hoping we'll be able to bring in our own strains, but I, I'm not sure. Uh, they may have a catalog. So MGP used to be Seagram's. Seagram's uh, owned Four Roses or whatever. Four Roses was also Seagram's at one time. Seagram's has a huge, huge yeast library. Over 250 that I'm aware of. And if you're familiar with Four Roses, they have uh, five yeast strains and two mash bills. Mm -hmm. So Jim Rutledge was always big on the yeast strains of, of how they can impart different flavors on it. Uh, so when we dial it in, I definitely want to pay attention to the yeast. I don't know what uh, MGP uses because I would assume it, I mean, it could be box yeast. It could be whatever. I mean, uh, Buffalo Trace uses Red Star box yeast, which is pretty wild uh, when you think about it. I'm sure it's their own little version of it. Uh, but, you know, yeast has a good, uh, probably more so than the mash bill, you know, yeast plays, I think, if you want to, if you want to say what's most important to me, it's the wood. Uh, number two would be the yeast, and then number three would be the mash bill. Hundred percent agree. Yeah. All right. 
everybody, if you haven't already, we can start, uh, I mean, maybe save some whiskey in your glass, maybe don't, it's yours. Uh, we can do another pass by on the, on the next round. Um, yeah, definitely come back to it, you know, let it open up. All of these are going to get affected by air. Uh, you'd be surprised how much they open up. I call a lot of them, they're going to be a 20 minute drink because they right. do, uh, they open up. It, it, it's, 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 it's really nice. They'll change. <laughs> And that's what I love about, um, you know, the classification of like sipping whiskey and just like whiskey in general. Uh, it, it, the evolution in the glass is amazing. It's so fun. And, and for those of you, like many of you have been on our, our uh, virtuals before, we, we usually recommend save half if you can and, and come through it at the end and we'll go through it one more time and see how much it changes and that's just part of the fun and the journey uh it it totally grinds my gears as a salesperson when i give someone a pour and they're like oh yeah shot oh like that took years and you just shot oh it burns yeah i bet it did uh, <laughs> uh and did you taste it or you just feel the burn it's like oh yeah it's good it's nice yeah, uh, right. not for me though and it's like oh man it could have been for you if you just smelt it first if you just rolled it around first um but uh the evolution of whiskey in the glass is is so much fun yeah so and, and char one comes from um you know we're kind of one of the first in the industry to use char one and so we wanted to take advantage of it we wanted to take ownership of it really we um you know we that basically is our small batch but you know, small batch is indiscriminate or whatever. It, it just it just doesn't do much for me. Um, so when we had the char one barrel, that really gave us, to me, I think, moving forward in the industry, uh, ownership of of char one. Yeah. So the second one is a toasted barrel, and so for. For those of you who don't know, Jason, what, what's the difference between a toast and a char? Well, it's just basically the time and temperature. Once again, I mean, you can manipulate wood a lot with the time and temperature, what type of heat we use. Uh, the, the toasted barrel does not get a char on it, but it does get a very long, long, slow, low temperature toast. And what we're doing is we're coaxing that wood to, the, uh, we're coaxing those sugars to the surface of the wood. If you've um, ever seen a tree with the branch cut off and you see that it has a knot there, you know that there was a branch there. So what happens is when you cut that off, all the sugars go to heal the wound. All the sap and sugars go to try to heal that wound of the tree. It's the same thing that happens when you toast and char a barrel, that the sugars come to the surface and they wanna heal the wound. And, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for these wood sugars. And when, you know, a barrel ages here in Kentucky, which is great because people say, why does all the good bourbon come from Kentucky? For one, it's the water. For two, nobody really talks about our climate. Our climate's very cold and it's very hot. Uh, we get a lot of blow up from the South and we get a lot of blow down from you guys. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, and when it goes, what happens is when, when the whiskey's sitting in that barrel, it goes in and out of the wood and it passes through those sugar layers. So when it's hot, it expands, and when it's cold, it contracts. And every time it goes in and out, in and out, and it's picking up more flavor and more color from the char, uh, but a lot of a lot of those wood sugars. Um, so that's why you can tell, you know, if a bourbon or a whiskey is older, because it's probably gonna be darker, you know, because it's picking up color and it's picking up a lot of flavor from the barrel. All well said. I'm I'm loving the nose on this this bourbon. I just said in the chat I'm getting like loads of cinnamon and like menthol notes. Now we've got more cherries, a little bit of like pepper or ginger or something like a nice yeah. sort of oily vanilla through there too, like you'd expect. Um, really and toasted really products. Toasted products really cool. Uh, you get a lot of cool flavors out of there. We we've done a uh, toasted French oak, which is unbelievable, but that'll be, that'll come around about once a year. 
because those barrels are like four times uh, the, the regular cost of regular finishing barrel. I think right. the difference, our, our regular barrels are like 250 that we buy to, to uh, rebarrel in and then that's about almost $800. So, size. yeah, yeah, all 53 gallons. <laughs> uh, it's like um, black forest cake or trifle kind of. Got some of those like sort of creamy notes on the top of it. everything else that's kind of sharp and spicy. Yeah. Man, that's cool whiskey. Yeah, I totally get those uh, dark forest cherry kind of Mm -hmm. notes on there those two expressions are our newest ones and they came out in july mm -hmm. uh, and they were they were kind of mirrored from our rise that we did so we haven't we, we we participate in one competition a year and that is the san francisco world spirits competition uh the only reason is they don't hand out medals to everybody and uh, it's recognized by the industry as kind of the, the quintessential uh, competition. So mm -hmm. we've, sent, we've sent seven whiskeys and we won seven medals. So I'm pretty happy about that. We uh, won uh, double gold for our toasted rye, uh, four golds and then two silvers. So awesome. we kind of think we're on the right track. And uh, like I said, we don't, I don't, we don't participate in any other ones because we don't care. We're not looking just for trophies. We're looking for something that matters and, you know, really care about what's, what's in the bottle. We had a question from Evan who's back at the shop. Uh, do you have access to Spanish Oak? Uh, probably if I call it independent Dave, uh, I would. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I could get it. Uh, I don't know anything about it. would love to, what I would probably do if we did a Spanish oak, what I would do is I would call independent stave company. I would ask him if he knows anything about it. If not, I would say, get some samples in. He would do some minor research on it to try to get some of the taste profiles, the, the chemical structure of it. And uh, could we do anything with it? And then we'd go from there. That's cool. I like that approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's cool is, is, uh, I, I don't, it doesn't cost me anything to use independent staves wood research department. You know, I can call him and say, do this. And he's like, okay. And, and independent stave pays for it. So you think about this technology, I mean, whether it's been around or not, nobody's ever utilized it like we have. And like this guy's doing down there, he's doing, you know, groundbreaking stuff. And then he takes it, you know, Maker's Mark is using it a little bit, but you think about somebody like Jim Beam, they do have a toasted, um, their Basil Hayden's toasted. And I would mm -hmm. put my, my, I'd put my, either one of my toasteds up against Basil Hayden all day and, and a blind taste. And I think we would win. And actually he, the, the same guy I'm talking about, uh, did the Basil Hayden toasted. And I, and I think I hurt his feelings. <laughs> Cause I said, this sucks compared to ours. And uh, he's like, I did that. So I, think I heard his feelings, but you, know, you, think, you think Jim Beam is this big ship. You, you know, you can't turn a ship on a dime. Like I can, I can do whatever. We can call and ask for Spanish wood. We can call and ask for all kinds of stuff. And, and right. I reckon they do it, you know, and it doesn't cost me any kind of research money, which is cool. I mean, it might cost me a barrel or two, but he does, a lot of a lot of uh, test runs on on just whiskey before we even get to it so it's it's almost proven before i even get to it it's it, i don't know man it's like shooting fish in a barrel it seems like if if you like if you like what we're doing i mean i think we're on the right track as far as the compounds that you're supposed to be tasting seems to make sense it does seem to make sense uh, a couple of questions to throw at you, mate. Uh, Teresa wants to know, does the toast need to sit longer to have the flavors mature? Actually, the toast uh, it, 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 in the rebarrel is less because the char is not there. So if you think about a char four as being this thick, which is an exaggeration, char one is this thick, the toast is right there. 
So you're getting those raw flavors without going through the char. So a toasted barrel, it can, I, I believe it can get overcooked because it gets to that raw wood and you don't have that char level to kind of filter out uh, the bad stuff. And that's basically what charcoal is. If you think about what charcoal does is it filters out the bad stuff. I mean, that's where they think that these uh, first, the charred barrels came from for bourbon was they used to reuse barrels. And, and back in the day, they didn't have forklifts and all that. They'd roll barrels onto flat boats and they'd roll it onto steamships. And you'd have 500 pounds of nails or uh, you'd put fish in it, you'd put whatever, and they would char a barrel to reuse it. So, so charcoal is a natural filter. Actually, I learned that uh, one gram of activated charcoal has the surface area of a football field. Wow. Now, go figure that out. I don't know. So charcoal is a, a good filter. Very cool. So think of how clean your whiskey is then. And every time you have a drink, you are doing wonders for your body. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Uh, there's one more question before we move on to the next one. Jeff said, have you experimented with independent staves, spiral cut, uh, wave stave barrels? Well, we have, we do, we have a wave stave barrel uh, and we don't do much with it because it, it, it's been, maybe we haven't used it properly or whatever. I, I don't know. We have a wave stave barrel that doesn't get put into, um, it doesn't get put in the game as much. It's sitting on the bench right now and the wave stave might not be the same one you're talking about, the spirit spiral cut. We have our own uh, proprietary wave stave, but it is a wave stave. That, that's somebody that's done their research there. Um, but we don't, it doesn't get played much. Um, we may have to look into it a little bit deeper and we've looked at the numbers. The numbers on it are pretty cool because what's cool. I don't know if you all know what we're talking about. A wave stave has these grooves cut in it. So there's high points and low points. It does increase the surface area by a little bit, but when you toast it and char it, the high points get different flavors than the low points. And so that's kind of a balancing, it balances out. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, we just haven't had good results from our wave stave that, that it doesn't stand out either way. It's a kind of like this, to me, it's almost like a balancing barrel. It's almost like you didn't rebarrel it. So we're going to have to figure out different ways to fool with that. But great question. <laughs> That's our Jeff. Comes prepared. He has good questions. <laughs> I, hope I, I hope I answered it. You know. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's move on to uh, our first rye of the evening. Uh, char number one, I believe. That was our order. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Don't shoot me anyone, but this smells like uh, that like three, that tri-colored toothpaste. <laughs> And dill note is absolutely there, right? Nice, oh, yeah. clean, sharp spices, but like fresh, fresh garden dill. I can just hold it. Aqua fresh. Oh, you're killing me. <laughs> um, like a, a good, um, like Winnipeg rye bread or a, a pumpernickel or something. It's got some, some heft to it. <laughs> that is classic MGP juice. And we, what what I love to do, I hope to take that out of it. <laughs> but you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Oh man, I love that. This is a really cool profile you guys have here. Yeah. Rye is kind of one of the categories that's starting to get a little bit more attention finally and recognized as rye proper. Because I don't know if you know Jason. Um, I don't know if it's so interchangeable down there, but in Canada, everybody refers to Canadian whiskey as rye. It's just yeah, a we, term. Are you guys? Yeah, Robert and I, you know, we, Jason and I had a lot of conversations about it, and, and tr you know, try to 
educate the public in Canada about the difference between, you know, Canadian rye whiskey and, and American rye whiskey. Like Jason uses 95% rye mash bill whiskey versus, you know, you can call whiskey made in, in Manitoba a rye. You didn't have zero rye in it and, yeah. and people. So, you know, you get a lot of, well, why should I buy this bottle for a rye for $125 when I can buy, you know, Canadian club for $24.99. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, so it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's a big difference. And the answer is rye. <laughs> yeah, it's strange. The like, being, rye. On the, being on the front lines, right. You're, you're constantly almost uneducating customers. In a sense, you're trying to back them out of something they've learned at some point that's completely wrong and indoctrinate them into the truth, right? And it's a category that when you have proper rye. But, you know, I've, I've been to, in, when I've gone to the U.S. and, and talked to shows and uh, uh, go to shows and talk to producers and, and other uh, distributors, you know, a lot of them think the same thing. Well, oh, if, if Canadian rye whiskey, it's 100% rye. That's, I've been told that so many times and, you know, had to educate, you know, more than just Canadians on, on the difference between, you know, what, what is Canadian rye whiskey? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it, you know. It, uh, it, it actually can be, which is crazy. And, and I don't want to piss anybody off by saying this, but when, when I do see Crown or whatever, it's basically colored vodka because you can, <laughs> add, you can add coloring and flavoring to Canadian whiskey. You can't to uh, anything in America, and it, to be a, a to be a rye in America, it has to be at least fifty one percent rye to be called a straight rye. Just like a bourbon has to be at least fifty one percent corn. Uh, most American ryes are actually in the fifty three to fifty seven percent rye. So even American ryes are real light ryes. Mine, which I never did like ryes, are ninety five percent rye, five percent barley. You know, and I think I, that, that I'm a I, bourbon drinker, Jason, and um, I think I've switched to a rye drinker. So well, it's, I it's, call I call your stuff. Call did our, it. Yeah, I call our rye bourbon drinkers rye because we're pulling those bourbon flavors from the secondary barrels. We're pulling those vanillas, the caramels. We're pulling all of that, and and that's what we're putting on the rye, and it it makes a whole different it's a whole different deal. Right, so you're taking all those bourbon profiles that I love that come from the barrel and adding it to the rye by actually, you know, giving it the same influence that the bourbon got, and it's just like for me, it's magic. So, I'm, I'm of course, I'm biased, probably everybody thinks, but uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I just love Buzz's Roost. So, yeah, when it, when it, I, when I, it, I particularly love the rise. When it hits and it hits right, I, I feel like Oz sometimes in the Wizard of Oz. It's, it's cool. I mean, it just when you're in the lab and it really hits, man, it is like, it's like nothing. It'll make you, it'll, it'll put goosebumps on you. That's how cool it is to me. You know, and I, you know, I never thought I'd be a geek in my life, but I'm, I'm the biggest Bergman geek. You probably, well, no, not the biggest one you'll ever meet, but uh, <laughs> that I, would love be being, I love being a Bergman <laughs> geek. Well, you're probably in good company here. I would Thank agree you. with that. No, this is a beautiful, like very complex uh, rye, for sure. There's a lot going on. I, I saw in the tasting note, someone said caraway seeds. That's a cool note. I dig it. Yeah, it's big and spicy and rich and definitely those dark fruit notes in there. But more spice to me than anything. And I'm happy, I'm sorry, like, I never can find dill very often in a whiskey and I'm, I'm, it's not my favorite note. So I'm glad I'm not finding it tonight. Now MGP is big in dill and, and, and a little bit of mint as well. And, mm -hmm. and I'm not a big fan of when I try to extricate that somehow, but. <laughs> More wood. No, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, whether you uh, meant it to or not, but a lot of, a lot of mint on here for me. If I can I'll brush my teeth with that rye, one. that'd be great. I'll have to revisit that. I don't have it in front of me, but. And I think everyone's different too. Like, I mean, I always hear about mint and spearmint and all these things and I almost never get them uh, out of, out of any rice, to be honest. So I think every, you know, everybody's palate is a little bit different, but. Oh, absolutely. But, I, but you're not, you know, you're not the first person to say that, so. 
Well, that's why I like doing uh, tastings with other people um, because I like to hear what other people find in their whiskeys. It, it, I may not have had that food or that flavor before, but it's interesting to see. And, and yeah, there's, there's always that, um, that subjective, uh, you know, profile that comes into play when you start saying things out loud. But for, for people who, you know, who are new to nosing product, uh, this, the recommendations of, you know, are helpful. It helps for people to, to better their vocabulary when they're trying to verbalize what they're, what they're tasting. Um, and it just, it just, it's like, Oh, cool. I've never, I never thought to look for that before that, that, and it, it's, it's a fun, it's a journey and I, I enjoy it. And it, it, it also tells a lot about a person, what they find in a whiskey too, about where they come from or what they like to eat or drink. And I enjoy that getting to learn uh, the people I'm, I'm with as well. Harmony yeah. is stalking you all to the extent of knowing what your diets are like. That's a little creepy. <laughs> no, I was like McDonald's chicken nuggets, <laughs> the spicy mustard sauce. Yeah. Mm. No, I was going to, I saw, I did see a chat there that the, the water does open it up and, and, and add the tannins really come out and it does dry it out to me. Um, and like I said, whatever, you, I encourage everybody to say whatever, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Um, and, you know, next time we go into the lab, it's going to be like, man, you know, I did hear this. And, and so I take it all in and uh i'm looking to make the best whiskey possible that i can because that's just what i want to do so uh constructive criticism is, is very cool and um i encourage it really well the good thing is there's nothing negative to say so far with two whiskeys left so yeah, we're, we're cruising. i mean whatever three whiskeys okay all right thursday barrel rye Toasted Barrel Rye. Yeah. What are we on? Toasted Barrel Rye. Oh, yeah. That was the double gold winner. Again, yeah. it's really desserty to me. It's got like good, like kind of slightly chocolatey notes behind it, but like that big sort of cherry push. That one to me. I felt like I took three non-selling points for me. It was a young, high proof, high rye. And to me, it doesn't taste young, it doesn't taste high proof, and it doesn't taste high rye. So and it, this that's one drinks, what I was going for. <laughs> I think this one drinks the softest of all of them so far, too. It hits the palate really soaky. I think the toasted barrel, to me, uh, the rye take a little take a little better to the toasted than the bourbon does. And I don't know whether we just need to switch our, our toast level on that barrel for the bourbon or what, but we're, 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 we're constantly tweaking stuff in to try to improve it. And um, I think we did pretty, we got pretty close to the head here with the, with the toasted rye. Is there a scale for toast levels or is it just the amount of time that you're toasting? It's basically time and temperature um, mm -hmm. and different types of heat. And, you know, it's just we're still experimenting with it. What compounds are coming out uh, at what temperatures? And it, that takes a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is beautiful. I really like the way it hits the palate. Like the nose just kind of up the ante for me because this one goes into like a, a slightly more rounded kind of profile on the nose there. And on the palate, it shows the same sort of thing where it arrives a little bit softer than the last one. Um, I typically like something more like the first one with the rise. They're just a little bit sharper on that char one there. But I think there's just an elegance to this one that just sort of elevates it to me. This is the one I kind of want to sip and like Jason said earlier, you know, just sit back and sip. This is like a, an hour long drink sit by the fire. Love it. Yeah. All right, totally. Uh, Teresa says she's getting like a Granny Smith apple 
and I can totally get that apple, like apple skins and, and kind of raw apple note. It's just at the back, hey? Yeah, I get it. Yeah, it's like on the finish for me. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, we will get you more ounces so you can enjoy this over the hour. <laughs> In fact, it's for sale uh, by the 24 ounce uh, option if you're interested. <laughs> wow, cool notes coming up here. Lychee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that nose is pretty. Um, it just seems to have tamed that like really, really active cask syndrome you get with a lot of, you know, young rise, bourbons, whatever else. Um, I don't know if it's just the toasting level or what you guys have done there, but that's pretty on palate. I love that. Very cool. So Jason, I know we're early here, but um, do you have something that you've made that is like your your baby, the pinnacle you've done so far that you are head over heels in love with? Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I love them all for, for different reasons and want, you know, kind of a broad stroke on the palette of, a, you know, whatever, you, however you want. I'm not very eloquent the way I speak, but you know, we, we have a broad stroke of whiskeys that, that hopefully there's something in there for, for everyone. And, and they're done like that deliberately. You know, what's cool is when I do a tasting that uh, everybody doesn't go to one. Like, say if you did Four Roses, Yellow Label, Small Batch, and Single Barrel. I know a lot of people like the Small Batch, but, you know, it's like, oh, we all, or the Pappy, we all love the 20 if we could get it, or something crazy like that. Uh, it doesn't happen when, when I do our tastings. It's all over the board. And, and so that makes me feel that I'm doing my job, that there's something out there for everybody. Uh, everything that we create is kind of cool because it's all new and it's new to me. And I've been in the whiskey business a little bit, you know, I mean, not forever, but I've been here for almost 20 years. Uh, you know, the cigar rye is really cool. And that is the sister uh bottle to the peated that we're going to drink here uh, later um and we can talk about that when we get there but those are cool concepts and they they work which is which is just wild you know i mean it, it, it's like you're a new you know you're discovering something new all the time and, and we're most of it's working like you know for me most of it's work and it's not we haven't found anything that we really just hated yet mm -hmm. but it is whiskey so yeah really tasty Teresa I completely agree this is awesome and it, it looks like the chat people are loving it the, uh, when is it available and give me some uh, coming up so uh, Robert's going to drop another case in our allocation so we can uh, hook you guys up as we just sold out over the weekend. So we'll get some more in for you. So, awesome. so when you ask Jason that question, is there one that really stands out for him? So they have one that's not in our market yet that really stands out for me. It's ruined all other whiskeys for me. And it's, it's their cigar rye. Uh, I chew tobacco like crazy. I'm chewing tobacco right now. They made this cigar rye that they, they cold they cold smoke Kentucky tobacco and they pump it into the barrel and then they re-age the rye in that. And I drank a bottle of it and every single sip was outstanding. And it, I, I actually I actually have this bottle of cigar rye and it's the only thing I've been drinking all night. So you know he you know That's he might not have a favorite one, but he there's one that just blows me away. And, and it's the cigar rye, so. Robert, what I'm hearing is there is a bottle of cigar rye in Alberta that should have been in this kit. Well, and you're you know. Hogging, was, you're hogging it all. 
I, I am hogging it all. So, uh, sorry. Well, we'll definitely figure something out for you guys down the road. Uh, it was uh, just it wasn't something that we we're gonna <laughs> to do right now because everybody is so excited about the bourbons. So uh, we, we don't want to introduce too much stuff at once and overwhelm everybody. All right. Well, we're not one to look on forward. that cigar rye. Let us know if it comes to Alberta. <laughs> I will. All right. Next one. Uh, I originally thought, you know, let's mix it up, do the peated for the barrel strength. But Jason is the master of his craft. And he said, no, 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 don't do not do that. We're going to jump into the barrel strength first. And we'll do the peated afterwards. So barrel, that strength barrel strength? that's the barrel strength ride. Yes. What's the, what's the proof on that? Um, math help, please. 57.15. So you're looking at what? 114.3. I love this one. Absolutely love the 114. There's a couple of different ones out there, obviously, that we've done. But this one, I think, is my favorite. Of the barrel strength rise, and I'll tell you about after I, I you know, love to hear some comments about it. But uh, I think it can lead people off a cliff, you know, if you tell them what's in there before they before they taste it. So I don't really like to talk about it before I get a, a good evaluation from anybody. Then I will mention it, and then you can either get it or you don't. Um, but that one, I absolutely, it's sneaky good. Mm -hmm. It's juicy. It's to have a couple, couple of metals on there. I just put them ah, on. Got some jewelry. <laughs> I don't know where the rest of them are. They haven't sent them to us yet. <laughs> it's a super juicy mouthwatering arrival, and then it gets a little grippy towards the back. Great, great palate development. Oh yeah. Apples again. Teresa says sweeter red oh, apple. Nice. I get that. And I don't know if it's because we were talking about the hats earlier, but I'm getting a little like little bit of that summer watermelon on here. Almost like candy peanut there too, without having that nutty Jim Bean kind of characteristic to it. Definitely. Give me your mouthfeel from the uh, higher fat acids. Uh, anyone? Says Robert, leading leading the group. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's the cigar rye you're tasting. No, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> this is definitely creamier. Very rich. I would almost think this was like PX finished, like sh a short PX finish or something, because it's so oh, gentle. Because it's so me. chocolatey and dark fruit cool 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 yeah so are you uh playing with the same mash bill on this one then jason 95 percent right that's all we do wow the only reason you know the, it's all basically the same juice the only reason it changes is is the barrels we put it in it's so fudgy. It's like it's like past chocolate. Um, the rye is actually kind of tame in it, believe it or not. It's not like a big spice bomb or anything. Like, mm -hmm. The fruits are bigger than the spices, and I love that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and dip in that. If you look at that one, and I think that's the right one. That it's got this uh, thin, thin, thin layer of honey stuff. It's mm -hmm. not. It, it was viscous. It's not like honey thick, and I we have these honeysuckle plants down here that yeah. when I was a kid we used to suck on them. Yeah, and totally. I, and it's just like it's not enough, but it's real, real thin, almost the middle of the back, thin honeysuckle for me. That's that's, and that's just. I mean, you got to look for it, but it's to me. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful whiskey. 
So are there some some special barrels you've tucked aside, Jason? Some that have your initials on them somewhere that are like, those are mine. Those are going nowhere but my cellar or whatever I choose to do them, those are mine. No, not really, not yet. Not yet? I mean, we're not we're not to that point yet. We we're tasting whiskey. I did a barrel pick today, single barrels. So we do have a single barrel program going on. Um we went to the lab the other day and pulled out 30 that were going into the single barrel program. We tasted every one of them. It's like, and we actually tasted more than that, but we needed 30 single barrels. And then, yep, that's going, that's going. So we're just barely sipping on them. But no, I haven't had a chance to, we, we are going to do some uh, what we're, founders, founders Reserve, I guess, is what we're going to call it. And it's going to be single barrels. Um, and that'll be just where the three of us get together and we're going to say, this is what we feel the way that this needs to go, you know, that that these are our, these are the top of the top. But we'll, you know, we'll see. And we'll get a healthy allocation here in Alberta, right? <laughs> we hope so. Yeah. Jeff says you should call them Bronner's Barrels. I don't know. I've. Contrary to popular belief, I like to stay under the radar a little bit. Yeah, I don't, I don't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's cool. Founders reserves are always a hit. Ah. Yeah, the, those bottlings that have that bit of a story as to who's making them, right? They're always the ones that like the whiskey geeks up a little bit more. Like Glenn Glassa did that Masters series. Um, Lafroy is doing something now for some of the managers at Ian Hunter and Bessie and stuff like that. It's cool because they're trying to reflect a bit of the heritage in there as well. And hopefully some of the styles that were uh, prevalent for those people and important to those people. Mm -hmm. So do the same, man. Do the same. Throw your name on it. <laughs> Maybe right, don't be right. as vain as Andrew in our store. It doesn't need to be your face, but your name is totally fine. <laughs> I was totally uh, thinking, Kurt, like the next Andrew bottle, it's going to be him and his dog <laughs> on all the new labels. It's not going to just be Andrew, be him and the dog. So uh, it was Andrew and Walter Ego Series, not just the Andrew Ego Series? Yeah, yeah. Or, and he'll call it like the Morale Series <laughs> because he keeps referring to his dog as the the, the morale officer of the shop. <laughs> uh, Chris, you said you're you're hit, picking up on a little bit of a metallic note. Is that before or after water? No water? No, just time in the glass. Oh no. <laughs> a lot of work goes into distilling that water out. Why put it back in, right? Yeah, no water, okay. Sweeter with water, as Teresa says. Well, maybe I'll try that on the second pass by. Uh, we have one more to go through here. Mm. Oh, it's so much tamer on the nose than the last one. Uh, points different, give or take. Not, not too much different there in terms of alcohol. I'm not just talking like an alcohol presence, just like in the nose itself. Maybe you got to wake it up a bit. Let's see. So when we first, uh, like I said, when we first started this, I didn't like, I, I didn't care for rise. I think I kind of told y'all about that, but, and I drink them for comparison because I own a whiskey bar. So I really don't like scotches, <laughs> even though I do drink them for comparison and to be able to talk about it. Uh, this one, man, came out so cool for me that I was amazed and, and just, absolutely love it it's a it's a 95 five heavily toasted charred to taste like a bourbon so it's a rye that tastes like a bourbon that finishes like a scotch it's, it's not enough for scotch not as enough for scotch people but for bourbon people i think it's plenty so it just <laughs> right and, and yeah i think you made a good point because you know i'm not a scotch drinker <laughs> Like just the way you described it, like where it's, I think just think it was a really good description and 
um it's the same for me like i'm not a, a scotch drinker i'm not not a, not i'm a, i'm an american whiskey drinker i'm um you know a bourbon drinker and and the pita is really interesting so it'll you know some of you have tried it. i don't know if everybody's tried it but you know the teresa said you know you don't get a really get any pita on the nose um it's, it's really interesting it's almost like a magic trick this thing so it's, it's just really interesting how i don't know if everybody's tried it and if i should even get into it but um like there's no there's no peat on the nose when you when you taste it on the front of the palate there's really no peat and then by the mid palate you start to get this peat starting to wake up and then it finishes with a peat and then for me it that peat dissipates and it almost transforms into like a the cinnamon hearts uh, in this really long echo of cinnamon hearts Interesting. Yeah, to me, it, it gets peaty on the very back. You got to look for it. You got to wait for it. And the more you drink, the more that peat builds up. Mm -hmm. And so how, how we did this is we toasted the barrel, uh, charred the barrel, and then we cold smoked the barrel with some island peat that we had sent over uh, from Scotland. So uh, we, we use a heat source over here and, yeah, basically and blow the smoke into the into the barrel. Interesting. So when I first picked this up compared to the last two, the nose was almost like not even there to me. It was so muted. Right. Um, and then you drink it and there's like, you're hit from all sides, bing, bang, boom, all these flavors, sweet, spicy, smoke, peat. Um, and I'm sorry, the peat comes slowly and in the back, like you said, but now I go into the glass again. And to me, it is all like, wood smoke barbecue notes like someone's throwing in different here's your applewood here's your hickory here you go and it's just constantly changing with these smoky notes not necessarily peat for me but smoke and it's sweet and smoky and it's totally interesting but I didn't get a nose till I drank it which is weird because I shook it up pretty good well it's definitely <laughs> gonna get it's gonna get the smoke from the peat for yeah sure. for sure yeah any smoked bacon, says Vaughn. So uh, when we sat and had our little powwow in the back of KWM there, I don't know if you guys remember, I said to you that we'd been burnt on one or two previous, and I'm not going to mention the brands where they had done some, you know, cast play with smoking the wood or whatever, and said I had never found one that worked, and this was the first time I had seen one of these that actually worked. And I stand behind that. Tonight, it's just a, um, it, I, I think I'm with Harmony here. It hits the palate softer than almost anything we've had before. Um, yeah. Not in the same way that when I was just talking about the creamy toasted barrel earlier, um, in a different way. It's just slightly more muted. Um, that smokiness is almost like leathery kind of on top of everything. Really pleasant, really pretty. Pete's really tame. I love this one. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a... Uh... I don't know. It, it was really weird for me. I wasn't going to, I acted like I wasn't going to be a big fan of it, but when you, when you start really digging deep into it, it, it's pretty wild and it just, it's just different. It's just different for what it, what it is and what it does. And um, it's not bad. I, I, I enjoy it and I, I never thought I would. Yeah. Um. Yeah, there's some uh, smoked salmon notes coming through, smoked cream on the palate, toasted cedar. Um, very cool notes. Should we um, speed round it back like to number one and kind of bounce back and forth and see how they hold up over time now, see how they've evolved a little bit? Yeah, ho hopefully Chris enjoys number five a little better on the second pass. Hey, and I just want to do like my own personal shout out to Vaughn. This is his first KWM tasting. Uh, he's never done a virtual tasting. He's never done a KDM, uh, KWM. So thank you, Vaughn, for coming out. Thanks for participating in the chat. It's always great to have uh, new friends on board. And uh, I hope you're enjoying these. I know uh, you're a... Uh, hardcore American whiskey drinker. So welcome to the club. We've got you hooked. Oh man, just, just nosing these. They're Great. so different. Just every glass is different than the first time around. Except for the peated because it's fresh. So it went through too quickly. Chris says it's his first taste. And I think he means since work ended today. <laughs> 
Yeah, you know, you look kind of familiar to me. Yeah. All right, guys, let's go through it again. Carwin Bourbon. Um, like a, an unbaked cherry pie, ready to go in the oven. Got that slightly doughy note now, still those big cherry tones, lots of fruit. Soft vanilla sort of note. Mm -hmm. A really soft now. It's not like that kind of fresh vanilla bean note you get in a lot of bourbons and stuff like that. Pretty. <laughs> Teresa says caramelized. And Chris says one bourbon, one scotch, one beer. That's his after party. So we're all going to Chris's place for the scotch and the beer, apparently. But uh, <laughs> right now we're all about the bourbon and then the rye. <laughs> Very bready, very doughy. I agree uh, with that. And huge vanilla notes on this coming through for me as well. I see some nods. There's a, there's agreements, big vanilla. Classic bourbon. Here's my uh, tasting glass. It's actually an old crow. <laughs> cool. You got to get a buzzard's one made for you. Well, I could call it a buzzard, but it'd be a buzzard in a tuxedo. <laughs> SWS name if I've ever heard of one. All right, number two, toasted oak bourbon. So that's a good, a good, you know, whatever question. A lot of people ask me where the name came from. Is it when I said we tried to start a distillery, we, we really did get to about the 10 yard line. Uh, we found a little town off the freeway in Kentucky called Waddy, Waddy Paytona. Waddy's on one side, Paytona's on the other, Kentucky. And uh, found 184 acres, had a 200 year old house on it, a couple of springs, and we were gonna make that our distillery. And we had a big investor lined up and he kind of left us at the altar. Um, but, the, but the road bordering the spring, or, or the farm was called Buzzard Roost Road. And I was like, well, we have to call it Mother Drust. And, and I took a lot of pushback from my partners, but uh, it finally came out. We found a graphic designer that did a really good job with the label. And uh, I always wanted something that sounded old, but I didn't want to revive an old label. I wanted something that was mine. And uh, hopefully, you know, I wanted it to sound like it's been around for 100 years. And then with the new innovation, it's almost kind of like a yin and a yang type thing. It's it's sounds old, but we use a lot of new uh, innovation. So that was kind of the thinking behind it, whether that's <laughs> whether it works out or not. But right, that's cool. No, I like the name. I like the label. Graphics are cool. Name stands out. Yeah, I'm kind of old school, and then the guy at Independent Stave, he's he's kind of young and new and innovative. So it's kind of old against the young, I guess. I don't know. You got to be somewhere around my age, Jason. So careful how you're throwing that old word around, hey? I, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm 54. This head's wore out about three bodies. <laughs> <laughs> All right, char one rye. Man, keep coming back to Ben's note earlier, caraway seed. He nailed it on that one for me. When I was talking yeah. about the different bread types, like pumpernickel and rye and stuff like that, the caraway absolutely nails it. I love this. I, uh, almost now that I was just running away from the glass, just the tiniest little whiff of patchouli too. Um, the more I try really, really cool rise, uh, the more I'm loving rise a category. It's always been something I was keen on, probably more so than bourbon. Um, I hate to say it, probably to most people chagrin right now, but um, I think I'm kind of starting to fall in love with rye. Welcome to the club, buddy. <laughs> it's exciting because, um, you know, we spend so much of our time talking about things we know inside and out, right? Like, Scotch to me, I've been standing in front of rooms talking about whiskey, like Scotch whiskey for close to 20 years now. Um, and rye is something that in a way kind of feels edgy and new to me. I've been drinking it for the same amount of time as Scotch, but I've never gotten geeky with it. So kind of fun to do these ones. Well, I look forward to coming back up there, hopefully maybe first or second quarter of next year. 
and do some more tastings and uh you know whatever we can do to to get the job done and have a good time so uh hopefully robert will have me and um we'll we'll be up there next year i hope so robert said he's a tobacco guy you did a cigar ride are you a cigar guy too then uh i used to smoke a lot more than i do now yeah i don't because I feel like shit in the morning and it's not because of the whiskey. <laughs> I drink the same amount of whiskey and smoke a cigar. I feel terrible. Uh, so I'm not blaming it on the whiskey. But I am blaming it on the cigars. I don't smoke as much as I used to, but um, used to and, and appreciate a good smoke. Um, but I, you know, I don't dip or anything like that. But um, the cigar barrel, what he was talking about is, is a sister to the peated. We, you know, instead of the peat, we use some Kentucky tobacco and it is really unique. And you talk about smoky barbecue, really cool. Um, and that's kind of a limited run as well, but it's a cool, um, it's a cool expression of, a, of one of our rise. Well, I'm, yeah, this bourbon is, this is, I'm not trying to lead anyone this so far. This bourbon's killing it for me top of the top of the list for the second pass which one sorry harmony the second bourbon the second char bourbon. one it's beautiful uh char one was the first one right um yes yeah. i ripped all my labels off in preparation for the dishwasher <laughs> yeah. so harmony's having a blind tasting of her own tonight but uh blind on the second pass fortunately her tasting notes somehow line up with ours Weird. <laughs> I just I just do whatever Jeff says, and I just agree also with Teresa, and then usually I sound smart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question from Benny. I assume this is for Jason. Uh, what have been your favorite bourbons over the years? Well, it, it's. Um, I mean, we're talking about stuff you can get or stuff you can't get, which. I mean, I think some people think I sound kind of like a jerk when I say that, but, you know, I've drank a lot of whiskeys over the years. And, and you know, today what you can find on the shelves for me down here might be a little different from you guys, but uh, I love wild turkey rare breed today. Yeah. Unbelievable flavor. It's beautiful, beautiful whiskey. I love old Grand A 114. I'm you know, going to get that one. Yeah, it's a great, great whiskey. Uh, even, the old grand, even the old granddad bottled and bond is, is, yeah. is uh, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. Um, but, you know, as far as it goes over the years, I mean, I've had, I've drank whiskey every decade from 1900 on. And oh. some, of, some of my favorites are really from the 40s and 50s. Uh, one of the best that a lot of people talk about uh, is the old crow chess piece, chess set, uh, of 1959 to 69 old crow, probably, you know, some of the best whiskey that I've ever had. Um, a lot of stuff put out by national Stillery back in the day. They did the old, uh, Taylor, old Forrester. I mean, not old Forrester, I'm sorry. Old Fitzgerald, um, not even, fuck, what am I saying? Old crow. And, um, I'm trying to find it. Anyhow, whatever. Um, a lot of good old old stuff because they just used to make it differently back then. Yeah, old Taylor and old Granddad. There you go. That's it. <laughs> um, they just made it differently back then. It came off the still at a lower proof, went into the barrel at lower proof. Less water added all the way around. A lot more flavors from the grain. If you think about a triple distilled vodka. You know, they run it up the still 190 and all the, all the flavors are stripped from the grain. Yeah. Uh, even now they come off, what is it, no higher than 160. Um, a lot of them come off at 150. I think that's too high. When I do my stuff, I mean, I'm going to come off maybe at 120 and go in the barrel at 100 proof. We're, we're going to have low barrel entry, but a lot of people, the, the distilleries now are, are actually picking up on low barrel entry but they're still coming off the still too high for my taste. So you're still going to have a lot of those oils and things left uh, 
from from the grains in there. So I'm going to come off about 120 if we can, and we're going to go in the barrel about 100. Cool. Uh, so in the coming off your spirit run, Jason, at that point, at 60, or at 120, sorry. I'm sorry, what's that? You're coming off the heart of your run at that point? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. 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 So what, what do you start taking at? Like, when do you cut off from the heads and start taking the heart of your run? At what percentage? Well, that's what we're hoping. We're, we're, we're hoping the head, the, the, the hearts are going to be around 120. Oh, my Lord. Wow. Okay. Like, wow. Okay. So just to put it in perspective for you guys, when he's talking about barreling at these kind of um, low ABVs and coming off the stills at these, something like Auchintosh and the triple distilling is coming off the still at 82%. As a rule, Scotland is barreling at 63 and a half. It's not a rule. I'm just saying as a general rule, they're, they're going into wood at 63 and a half. So you're going like 13 and a half points lower. That's crazy. So are you finding you're going up in strength, Jason, in the barrel in warm Kentucky Rickhouse? Uh, yeah, it, it, not, you know, I would say 90% of our whiskey goes up in strength as, as far as scotch goes down. Right. Uh, just, okay. just because of our, just because of our climate. Now, mm -hmm. stuff on the bottom bottom rungs of the warehouse might go down or stays about the same. So you got to get above the, like the, maybe the third floor to start really getting that that movement. Yeah. So if you go in at 110 or whatever, even if it does come down, you're going to be still at 100 proof. Right. So that's what you're looking for. You're looking for. If you come down, you're you're not going to come down under 100. If you go up, you're not going to go up that much to where you have to add it, that much water to it. <coughs> you said earlier you were not a scotch drinker, but I think when you next come out, Robert needs to bring you down south. I'll pour you scotch until you're stupid, and we'll find the ones you like. But we need to geek out on some of these things we're talking <laughs> about right now. I got a lot of questions for you, mate. I'm up for it. Um, Chris said, how many barrels do we have in stock? It, it, it's kind of rotating mm -hmm. um, because we're adding states. And if you think about, uh, it only sits in our barrels for two to six months. I mean, right now it sounds bad, but we're basically flipping whiskey. And, and it, it, you know, it, we don't sell it till it's ready. We, we're, we're doing a lot of tasting, don't get me wrong. Um, but the, the, our inventory is constantly growing and constantly depleting as we're adding states uh, and we're adding volume. Right. So I wish I knew, but I, I don't have that number. I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't have that number. Uh, Teresa, was your question answered at all? Uh, she was asking if you do any waterproofing in the barrel as it ages. Is that correct? She's gonna, she's gonna answer, let me go back. If I'm understanding that correctly, no. And we probably won't. Once they're barreled, they'll sit there. Okay, so you're not adding water in the barrel as it's aging, because like you said, you're, you're buying aged spirits, finishing flipping, is that it? No, we, we won't do that. Good. Um, <laughs> Proofing in the barrel, she said, versus proofing before bottling was her question. Well, that would be, it would be a huge expense to do that. And, but we don't um, because we just, we just, we just batch at the end. Now there, there's a, there's a couple of different uh, schools out there that they talk about more water reacts differently and, it, and it's better for the whiskey, which uh, makers did this uh, linear program that I had and and it just doesn't seem I don't know I think, I think the less water the better um, we do start with low barrel entry proof or we will and we'll we will actually start with lows uh, coming off the still so hopefully we had more flavor and less water even though even though like I said some people say you have to have water to make the chemical reaction, which I think is kind of bullshit. But we lose about 3% every year. We'll lose 6% the first year because it's a new barrel. And then we lose 3% every year after that. As far as the angel share goes, 
uh, as far as concentrating that flavor. Uh, water molecules are smaller than alcohol molecules and they escape the barrel. So that's what that is. So when did you buy your first barrel, Jason? Uh, we hit the market in 2019. So a little bit before that, I mean, we've been working on this over six or seven years right. uh, with the distillery and the, the, you know, we wasted a little bit of time there. Uh, but we actually started with three barrels at, we were doing all of our work at a buddy of mine's place called the Neely Family Distillery oh. uh, up in Northern Kentucky. We, uh, we had one single barrel and our small batch was two barrels, very small batch. I love it. And then we, we've just been growing from there. But we're, I think we're going to buy, I, I don't know, a couple of hundred barrels before the end of the year to get it off the books and, and get it down. And and I just know that that's coming. We're, we're trying to get that done before the end of the year. And it's a couple of hundred barrels. You were talking earlier, you're going to, you've got um, somewhere lined up to distill now. Right. Well, you we're contracted to still. We're contracted yeah. to still. So, yeah. and we're also open a tasting room here in Louisville, Kentucky, down on Main Street. Nice. Um, we bought a little still, so we're we'll, we're going to be doing our own production here uh, about the first of the year. But we'll probably be doing about one or two barrels a week cool. down there, and then that that'll go into our char ones. So, cross your fingers. We'll we'll see what happens from there. Do you still have an eye to your own distillery at some point? Is that still? Yeah, you know? that's going to be a phase three. We so we had a fundraise to raise some money from investors. We had a first raise, which which we completed, and and everybody's happy. Uh, we just opened a second raise, and it was for about five million bucks, and it got filled up pretty quick. And so we're going to have a third raise, which is going to be. Uh, land and a distillery and all that. Um, the second raise was to buy money or, or buy buy whiskey and, and expand and hire all the people we need to hire. And then the third phase will be probably the end of next year. And um, we'll, we, we'll have our sights on a small distillery, about a 14 inch column still. And uh, we'll do production just for us. We're not going to do contract work with the other yeah. Like the big distillery, we were going to do contract work, and we decided against that. All right. Where were we, Harmony, in our lineup here? Um, uh, we're revisiting the first rye. The first rye. I don't know what they are now. I kind of went to look. I think it's toast. Back up. Chard? Char one? Char one, yeah. Okay, cool. I know a little bit. <laughs> Chris finished all of his samples. He's rush. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking. Thanks, Sean and Robin. Have a good night. See you all. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, these ryes are so good. I almost finished my first rye on the first pass. It was almost all gone. But there's enough in there. I have a barrel tasting at like 10 o'clock in the morning. And oh, I so had we're, one, we're not keeping you up at all. No, no, not at all. I mean, I'm going to be doing this anyway, but I had one at uh, two o'clock today. <laughs> and my wife is like, you know, remember, you know what it tastes like. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, well, at least she's focused on the job. Right. I was thinking you're going to say something like, remember to come home or eat or shower or something. I think what pisses me off is she's like, oh, you're going to work? I'm like, mm. come on. <laughs> I, I know what that's like. <laughs> I said, you chose your job, I chose mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I work a couple hours from home a couple nights a week. He's he's going to Saskatchewan for three weeks. Like, yeah, pick your poison. And let's face it, whose job's more fun? This is way more fun. Um, Teresa said on the toasted rye, so good, liking it even more this time around. Cool. I think you got it. Um, air helps out, and I try not to take a shortcut with water. You can, but it, it's just for me, 
if you have the time, it's worth sipping it for 20 or 30 minutes. That's really what it's meant for. It's meant right. for, you know, this, this kind of ride you're taking for, you know, the next 30, 40 minutes. Mm. And like, like Chris is doing, I love smelling an empty glass because it really pops then. You really, really get what's in there. But well, it's not he's a little bit. Yeah. Or he's faking it and he's moved to the couch. <laughs> it looks kind of dark. I don't know what he put in there. What is that? So you, so you guys did, uh, you know, had Jason in the store doing a tasting. So, you know, when he says 30, 40 minutes to drink a glass of whiskey, you know that his pours are like this, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I remember I his thinking, pours. Like, like, who, who takes 40 minutes to drink an ounce of whiskey? But Jason doesn't pour an ounce of whiskey. He's got American pours. It's a four <laughs> ounce pour. I'm from Kentucky. Yeah, no, I remember I mean, his pours, had, and then he handed it I've to you, about, and like, okay, you do it, you do it. I've had about three or four of these. <laughs> Kentucky hugs like a bear hug. You can feel that. Kentucky bears. <laughs> cool. All, All right. right, let's move on to the back ones here, just so we've had a couple jump off, so hopefully we're not keeping anybody too late here, but uh, let's go to the barrel strength now. Yeah, that's what I'm on. I'm on. I'm getting more of that apple note. I think that's Teresa's, uh, if we're talking about the same one there. Apple crisp is good. Where you hate when you taste something and you can't find the words? No, usually I talk way too much. I have all of the words. It's having all the extra words in there that's the problem. That's because you're you're a writer. You have all of the words. I no, it's just because I'm full of myself like Andrew is. <laughs> well. Chris says that's because I'm toasted. Toasted. All right. Um, same same reaction to that barrel strength. Um, super jammy, super mouth-watering kind of profile. I love that. And that that just slightly tannic note at the back really works for me too. Um, coming to the peated barrel now that it's had some time to oxidize a bit and stuff, the peat is finally there on the nose for me. It's really, really faint. It's really, really soft, but it's actually there now. I wasn't getting it the first time around, really. I don't know. All of the things. I'm, I'm definitely getting, like, uh, on this peated. Shit, I missed it. I it was there and it was gone. Smoked fish for sure. I don't know why, but I'm getting it. So I'm with you, Kurt. Uh, like, you know, a lot of the times I can't find the peat, but sometimes when I let it sit and I drink some and I come back to it later, then I'm like, oh, there it, it is there. And it's just so subtle. Yeah. When, when you can find it. That, that's meat. that's per me. Next time we, we, we talked about putting a little more peat on it. But to me, it was very, very subtle and I could pick it up because, you know, I'm not a scotch drinker. So that's kind of, um, that's kind of the, what I was looking for there. And to me, like I said, it's very subtle. Um, the more you drink, the more it will come out. And, um, you know. I think it's such a perfect marriage between sort of like, you know, if you have scotch drinker friends and you're a bourbon drinker, and, you know, you can go, okay, well, here, try this. And they won't be uh, offended because there's some something in there they recognize. And then vice versa, if you have some bourbon drinkers or some American whiskey drinkers that start, start starting to get curious about crossing over the scotch, this is kind of that perfect marriage where you can sort of introduce, well, you know, your, your, one, one, your brother to your cousin type of thing. <laughs> so Yeah. Believe me, I've had the Lafroigs and the what is it, Log of Vulin and uh. I I honestly think, man, you know, when we talked at KWM, when I said that this was the only one I'd ever come across that worked for me uh, for North American peated whiskeys, um, I was sincere there, and I worry that you know, okay, if you up the peating level, are you going to unbalance this? Because this is pretty, man. Like, well, I mean, it, we're, we're, I think we can up the. I think we have some notches. We can still go up on the peat, not screw it up. All right, let's see another <laughs> tasting. It sounds like we're lining up another tasting. 
Sounds like we're sending Jason a scotch kit. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> okay, so I'll just, I'll, Lies. I'll just <laughs> dabble with it and we'll go from there. All right. Um, that's our range today. Um, this is normally a time when we say get home safe if you need washrooms and stuff, but I think you guys know how to do both of those things in the facilities you're in at the moment. <laughs> um, I, I can't speak for the guys here. Uh, you do have a couple moments, I think, to throw some questions in the chat if you want or if anybody needs to or just I think our group is also small enough if you want to Turn unmute and on. be respectful. Please unmute and sure. cameras on or off, doesn't matter. Um, we won't keep Jason too long. Jason, what time is it? Sorry, where you are? It's two hours ahead. Two Does hours. Doesn't matter. Ahead. Yeah, we don't want to keep you too long, man. We get it. We get it. Um, uh, Ten thirty-ish. Ten thirty-ish. Uh, this tasting didn't happen tonight for the price it did without uh, Robert and Jason coming to the table. Um, and man, these the bourbons. We went back and forth a couple times, and Robert's like, "I'll get them to you," and they had them shipped up. To us to make this happen for tonight um as you can tell harmony and i were big fans of what they're doing um and it's it's not just the ethos it's not just the mentality not just the fun we had with these guys and their personalities and stuff but we thought that everything we had in the glass that day spoke to us and we wanted to have it and i think tonight kind of shows that for you guys too we saw a lot of positive comments and stuff so um we have kind of nudged and pushed and you know shouldered our way into the room a little bit and said um barrel picks this sounds kind of fun you know kensington logo on a barrel pick sounds okay to us um so we're we're hopefully we've done enough fishing here that we've got them on the line for um what we're looking for going forward uh but a, a, a fun fun range so i want to thank you guys for making this happen tonight jason for dialing in from way far away and much later than we are here. So we appreciate that. Uh, Dude, I'm just getting started. <laughs> I, love right on. I love it. Yeah, this is pre-gaming for us too here at 8.30. We got lots of time left. Yeah, lots of time. I didn't even show the sidecar I had to wine. <laughs> <laughs> Naturally. I just got uh, right too, buddy. So, so speaking to the, uh, to the bourbon lot, to the two new bourbons. Mm -hmm. um, so the toasted bourbon, Toasted American Oak Bourbon is available now. Um, just got here to Alberta. And, or sorry, yeah, the Toasted Barrel and the Char One was actually just bottled about five days ago. Cool. So it's, uh, our, our shipper is just um, making arrangements to pick it up any day now, and then it'll be headed to Alberta. Okay. Um, so I'll just say, uh, if anybody on the line is interested in the bourbons, they are coming. Please uh, message either harmony at kensingtonwinemarket.com or kurt at kensingtonwinemarket.com and we'll be sure to hold you a bottle before they arrive. We do have the peated in the barrel strength rye available in store today. Put uh, buzzards roost in your comments and you'll save 10%. And we're gonna get allocations of the other two ryes and we'll restock. So please just email us Again, Kurt or Harmony at Kensington Wine Market, and we'll reserve your bottles for you when they arrive. Um, this has been awesome. I, I feel like, Kurt, I hear uh, a second trip in our future, a Kentucky trip uh, coming uh, very soon. Uh, we'll, we'll redo the, the Mexico thing when you're in better health, and we'll try it again in Kentucky. Um, but this has been really, really awesome. I loved the uh, char one bourbon, uh, and I liked the uh, the toasted rye a lot. I feel like I'm parroting what was in the chat earlier, but uh, they're all awesome. But those are my top two. Kurt, what were your favorites? Uh, just Sammy threw his in there. He said char one rye and peated. Um, yeah, yeah, really cool. Uh, for me, I just love the juiciness of that barrel strength awesome it lit me up like crazy and the one right before that the toasted rye was really really cool to me um the rye definitely had my heart more than the bourbons but i love the bourbons too as we talked about when we were there but i'm, yeah. I'm really digging these rye's they're gonna be a lot of fun to watch over the years oh yeah, yeah. Isn't, that the, isn't that the funniest thing because you know norm i love mgp bourbons 
Mm-hmm. And we do too. These they and you know, M, M, lots of other people used MGP rye, but these ryes, uh, they have my heart. I'm I'm with you. I love the fact that people are starting to recognize that you don't necessarily have to hate on the big guy just because they're the big guy and stuff. Evan and I were talking in the shop just yesterday, I think, um, or really, really recently, if not yesterday. Um, MGP is putting out some of the best whiskey going. Absolutely incredible stuff coming out of there. The quality is next level. The consistency is next level. Um, Flavor profile is drastically different depending on who takes it, but you kind of recognize some DNA but it's always, always good stuff. So it's good stuff to be working on. Pretty exciting. And, and you you don't get to be that big you. without doing something right. I mean. So, and for me, Jason's is Jason's changing these enough that they're just so distinct that they're, they're buzzards roots. So. I'm on cool. Yeah, there's, these are really good. Um, these are amazing. Thank you, Jason. This was uh, this was great. Thank you all. I mean, it was. Um, I mean, it was a great time. Can't wait to get back up there and. Uh, I can work you to death some more. Yeah, we were we worked worked. I guess. We worked, man. Yeah, we we'll get that. We we'll get that cigar malt cigar rye in here. We'll have seven. We'll do an in-store tasting. It looks like Robert's donating a bottle right now to an insurgency. Well, this, is, this is my bottle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my mistake. Sorry, Rep. <laughs> but, oh, we'll, see, we'll see what we can come up with. Yeah, whiskey and cigar tasting. But someone's got to babysit Jason so he doesn't get sick. <laughs> yeah, well, whatever. I know we'll, the give feeling, him a, we'll give him a vegan cigar. <laughs> I just feel like shit the next day. My, my head's all cloudy. I'm the same that way. Is, that's for your taste buds too. Yeah. So, yes. You know, I yes. mean, I I do appreciate a good cigar. No, but. I've I've done cigar and whiskey tastings with people, and someone always throws up, and <laughs> and then. Everybody messages and says, I feel terrible today. I didn't go to work. I haven't done anything. My kid had to call for a ride for whatever <laughs> event. It happens every time. It's just it's just the mixture. And I mean, if we're sipping on multiple whiskeys over an hour plus to see their sippability plus smoking, it's it's just bad to happen. <laughs> 